Good afternoon, everyone. So I would like to welcome you all to the second session in the SBI2 High Content 2020 Conference. I'm very excited about this session. It is on high content imaging innovations. And we have two talks for you on complementary technologies. My name is Jeff Moffitt. I'll be one of the moderators of this session, which is also co-moderated by David Andrews. Our first talk today is going to be uh, from Dr. Sandro Santagata. Sandro is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and practices neuropathology at Brigham and Winneman's Hospital, where he directs a, a, a laboratory in the Department of Pathology. He's also a member and a leading player in the Ludwig Ken uh, Center at Harvard and the Harvard Program in Therapeutic Science, as well as the HMS Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology. And he is playing major, a major role in generating cellular atlases of tumors as a part of the National Cancer Institute Moonshot Human Tumor Atlas Network. He has been a huge pioneer in the field of high dimensional pathology. So massively multiplexed immunofluorescence as a tool for understanding the architecture of tissues and how that architecture plays a critical role in pathology. And I think it's just gonna be such a treat to have him here today and have him tell us about this technology that he has been involved in the development of and its application. So with that, can we go ahead and, and start up Sandro's talk? Hi, my name is Sandro Santagata. I'm from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, today, I'll present a talk, uh, Multiplex Imaging to Understand the High Dimensional Pathology of Human Cancer. My disclosures, I'm a consultant for RareSight uh, and we use some of their slide scanners for imaging uh, part of the slides in this presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank um, members of the Lab of Systems Pharmacology, uh, directed uh, by Peter Sorger, who are the foundation and creative spirit uh, behind the multidisciplinary tissue imaging uh, and work that I will uh, present today. A brief outline, I'll first give some context about anatomic pathology, uh, then I'll address some broad themes in multiplex tissue imaging, focusing on approaches as well as some key areas of use, in particular immune profiling, but also translational research, basic science, some cell biology, and uh, finally, atlas construction. This is the foundation of anatomic pathology, glass slides, H&E stained uh, tissue sections, immunohistochemistry of one or two markers per slide, then the use of a light microscope interpreted by a pathologist, and then uh, read out as a diagnosis. Uh, I will not, in this talk, um, focus at all on AI and H&E and its role in diagnostics, which is a transformative uh, new uh, field for, for pathology. Instead, I'll focus on multiplex tissue imaging. Um, so our role in pathology is as disease taxonomists. We are, our, our goal is to classify tumors, and we, we, we do that basically on this concept of histogenesis. We're looking at the similarities of tumor cells um, with the suspected cell of origin, and we do this based upon like microscopy and some immunohistochemistry and H&E. So basically we're phenotyping tumors and putting them into categories. Recently, although not too long ago, we started integrating genetic information into this diagnostic process. So the classification now includes well-established molecular genetic parameters as defining features of tumors and there's an integration uh, in our diagnosis that involves phenotype and genotype. Um, the more precise categories now, these more precise categories are the foundation for genomically guided clinical trials. But what's next, and can we extract more useful information from these slides than we have been doing already? This is an example of our pathology workflow, just to give you a, a broad sense that we provide different information at different stages. In the operating room, uh, when the patient is still on the operating table, we receive tissue fragments that we freeze and perform tissue sectioning and H&E review. Usually the quality of those tissues is not extraordinary and the diagnosis can be challenging. A few days later, we have fixed um, tissue in formalin fixed paraffin embedded FFPE that has much better morphology on H&E, and also we can perform IHC 
And at that point, um, we provide a, a first diagnosis. We then um, can alter and amend the diagnosis and add in additional information when we receive genetic information from fish or PCR or methylation studies, copy number analysis, targeted sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. And at that point, often two to three weeks later, we provide an integrated diagnosis. But still, as you can imagine, a lot of information is left unextracted in these specimens. So where does multiplex tissue imaging fit in in this paradigm? And I think the more we think about this, the more we think everywhere. Understanding cell composition, cell states, and spatial arrangements uh, clearly will have roles in, in clinical use, in patient diagnostics, in the development of drugs uh, for treating um, currently untreatable diseases, as well as in preclinical development. And I will argue even further uh, maybe one of the more exciting areas indeed will be in basic science discovery using human tissues for, for basic science and, and cell biology. So this is pretty much a transformational moment for pathology. We're, we're going um, from flatland, a two-dimensional world of H&E and IHC, into uh, spaceland, uh, a higher dimensional world where we're ex uh, extracting features that we have not been able to do uh, yet to date with the technologies that we've had in hand. So this is really a moment that I think uh, will, will, will bring us dramatically into the future as a field. And the assays that are, are poised to do that are, are these multiplex antibody-based imaging tools where we image 20 to 60 antibodies uh, all on a single slide. And by doing that, we, can, we derive a tremendous amount of information, high content information, that allows us to define cell types, their states, and their spatial arrangementships. So now we can identify this as a fibroblast and the proximity to a lymphocyte and where the tumor cells are and how far they are from blood vessels, et cetera, et cetera, layering on DNA damage, proliferation, and other phenotypic markers. So it's really an amazing um, new ability that we have. And in doing so, we, we hope to, you know, the, the aspiration here is to, to find tissue motifs and spatial networks of cells and to use that information uh, for patient stratification, drug target discovery and efficacy, as well as precision medicine. So this is where the field is moving rapidly towards uh, at the moment. I won't go into a lot of detail uh, in terms of the, of the methods that are used, but there are optical imaging methods and their um, ablation imaging methods. These uh, generally use antibodies that are conjugated either directly or indirectly to fluorophores, and then, then information about a fluorophore signal is captured by a by, by a microscope. And then there are other methods that use uh, antibodies that are conjugated to metals and lose, use later of laser ablation or ion beam sputtering. And, um, and those are the two main methods. I think the key point in this though, is that, there, that no method is the perfect method. Uh, there are benefits and limitations to each and considerations need to be made in terms of resolution, sensitivity, dynamic range, the maximum number of channels, the speed of acquisition, the complexity of the data and the, and the method, the cost and whether uh, you need whole slide imaging or region of interest analysis. Uniformly though, there's clearly an underestimation of computational analysis required to understand this data, the data management and, uh, and how you need different people with different expertise to work together as a multidisciplinary team for integrated, uh, for developing integrated insights. The method that we use is called tissue cyclic immunofluorescence. It was developed at the Lab of Systems Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School by Jerry Lynn and Peter Sorger. In brief, it's an antibody-based method in which the antibodies are directly conjugated to fluorophores, generally three antibodies. Um, those antibodies are incubated with uh, FFPE tissue. There's a nuclear stain, four-channel imaging of the three antibodies and a nuclear stain, then photobleaching and successive cycles anywhere from eight to 20 of this, um, of this type of imaging is performed. The data is registered uh, and then stitched together to create these 20 plex uh, images. And then that data is used for image segmentation and subsequent analysis. I'll just give you two examples just to give you a sense of the imaging. You can see that there are grids here. So these are each individual fields of view that are stitched together. This is from a tonsil and this is a, of a lung cancer. So we generate these large gigapixel images of resection specimens that are up to five centimeters in size, uh, square centimeters in size. And then we construct by stitching together these many views, um, these, these, complex, um, these complex data sets.
and you can just track each of the channels through and see how, how the different markers um, are present and their spatial distribution. Critically, it's important to use uh, antibodies uh, of high quality, and we, we publish methods for qualifying antibodies in high dimensional space. One of the ones that is most powerful is to use uh, multiple antibodies, three, four, or five, to the same target, and then to look on a pixel by pixel level of how the, how this, um, the signal uh, uh, correlates between the different antibodies. So you can find good antibodies with high correlation, as well as antibodies that are, that are not well correlated at all. There's cell level analysis to make sure that the antibodies are co-segregating. Uh, the markers are co-segregating with other uh, expected markers. Then tissue level anal analyses that the markers are expressed where they're supposed to be expressed and further uh, methods that we describe in, 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 in the manuscript. But um, this is helpful for, for both well-established as well as for new antibodies and particularly for new antibodies where patterns of staining are not necessarily obvious. The key areas of focus of multiplex imaging um, in clinical care and, and, and cancer research um, generally have been, um, you know, it's been driven mostly by immune profiling. So I'll focus quite a bit on that uh, in the area of patient management, but also for clinical trial correlative analyses, trying to find biomarkers of response, trying to find new biomarkers uh, for, for, for initiating uh, new types of immune therapy trials, but also thinking beyond immune therapy. I'll, I'll give some examples of that, as well as uh, in preclinical research and basic science, and as I mentioned, Atlas Construction too. Uh, it's often nice to have research tools and analytical approaches that are, are that work in the research space, but also can be applied directly to the clinical space, allowing for a rapid transition of ideas into clinical practice. One example is shown here. This is the current, the current state of the art for immune profiling in the clinic, where six markers are generally used to, to profile a tumor. This is an exophytic large melanoma with an attached piece of skin with melanoma in situ, which I'll show in the next slide. Typically now one, one channel is used for uh, DNA staining, the other for a tumor marker, and then leaving only four markers available for um, profiling the immune cells in that tissue. This is a, an image of only uh, five marker, five, five images of a, of a 40 uh, uh, plex data set. Um, and you can already imagine that by going from, from six to 40, it, it provides a tremendous amount of uh, capacity for, for detailed cell composition analysis. Um, and, and here I show some UMAPs, uh, you know, d demonstrating T cell and immune cell checkpoint marker um, distribution. I'm not showing the markers here for macrophages or dendritic cells or NK cells, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that we, the, the state of the art soon will be a much deeper um, compositional analysis and spatial analysis of tissues. Uh, you can also get a sense of how important it is to do whole slide imaging. So instead of small fields of view, uh, assessing the entire tumor and the neighboring region uh, will pro pro uh, in principle provide uh, important information. And we need to start to explore whether that's true or not uh, in the months ahead. Spatial analysis is also very important uh, here. Um, as I was mentioning, there's a, there was a region of melanoma in situ in that prior uh, image. Here's that region of melanoma in situ. These are the melanocytes trickling along here in red, the, the neoplastic melanocytes. Here is a region of tumor regression where the immune system, the CD8 uh, positive, CD3 positive T cells, here, here seen in white, are, are, um, um, are involved in, in um, the death of those cells. And then here is a region where, where that's where it's fully resolved where no melanocytes are left. So there, there's a need for regional analysis. Here you can see there are lots of T cells. Here there are many macrophages. There's need for cell-cell interaction analysis as you can start to appreciate here at, at a higher power. And in fact, more so, uh, we're learning that there's actually quite a bit of subcellular information that can be extracted. Here is a tumor cell, um, um, a melanoma cell, uh, and here is a um, is a lymphocyte. This is um, a lymphocyte that is a, a T cell exhausted. So it has both lag three and Tim three expression, but the expression is not uniform. It's actually polarized, which is also quite interesting. And the meaning of this type of information uh, is, is 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 again another area of of intense focus. I'll show you some applications now for clinical trial correlatives. This is work from Anina Farkula that she performed while at the LSP. She was interested in, in understanding 
responses to um, niraparib, a PARP inhibitor, and uh, pembrolizumab uh, targeting PD-1 in ovarian cancer in the Tapacho trial. So she, she analyzed using multiplex imaging and genomic approaches samples from 62 patients. And in doing so, she, she was able to find determinants of response. And those broke down into two types. There was, there were, there was the determinant um, that was dictated by mutational signatures that showed a homologous recombination deficiency in the tumor cells, signature three, as it's called. And there was also a spatial component too that was a determinant. And that was finding uh, interferon primed uh, exhausted CD8 T cells in proximity to pd one expressing macrophages and tumor cells in the microenvironment. Patients that had either one or both responded to treatment. Patients that had neither did not respond. But again, um, I think there are much deeper analyses are possible. Here is an image, a high resolution image, in, image from one of the samples. And you can see that um, there, this is really quite impressive how macrophages have polarization of their PDL1 in the process of neutralizing and, and leading to dysfunction of T cells. So a lot of subcellular information is still uh, present in these samples and a lot more analysis is required of this, of this deep uh, high content information. And here's another image um, that is even um, more striking in some regards where we're, it's, it's optical sectioning of five micron sections. These are 250 nanometer sections that have been stitched together. And uh, we're focusing in here on PDL1 in green and PD1 in purple. And you can see almost a structural biology type um, uh, assessment and view here of the interactions between these two molecules and their potential juxtacon signaling. So again, more and more information is available that we can start to extract from tissues than we've ever been able to extract uh, before. Another application in the immune profiling is, um, is this example from Jennifer Guerrero, who also works um, as part of the LSP and is at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, she's interested in studying uh, triple negative breast cancer and has shown that in TNBCs that are uh, BRCA mutant, uh, there's a, a large number of, of, um, of macrophages seen here in, in, in light blue and that there's also a large number of, of dysfunctional T cells shown here in, in green uh, compared to normal uh, triple negative breast cancer. So using high dimensional single cell profiling of human uh, TNBC, she's been able to demonstrate a significant increase in tumor um, associated macrophages as well as dysfunctional T cells in BRCA mutant breast cancer. And now she too is, is uh, gearing up to analyze Tapacho samples, in this case, um, the, uh, the triple negative breast cancer arm of Tapacho uh, studying um, PARP and uh, PD-1 inhibition in, in over 50 uh, TNBCs. We've, we're using immune profiling in somewhat different ways as well. We're trying to find new targets, for instance, here in glioblastoma in work by Shannon Coy, one of our fellows. Uh, we're studying purinergic signaling by the CD39, CD73 pathway that takes ATP and um, breaks, that, breaks it down into adenosine, which is immunosuppressive to T cells. We've shown that uh, glioblastoma tumor cells express high levels of CD73, a good subset, maybe one third of them do. There's also um, presence of, uh, the presence of CD39, the upstream enzyme in the process that's found in macrophages, dysfunctional T cells, as well as in endothelial cells. So a complex immune uh, environment is being created by this multi-component enzyme system in glioblastoma, where you studied this, the this expression of uh, 40 markers in, um, in approximately 200 samples. And now we have single cell analysis and ecosystem analysis underway to understand how these um, cells and, and these enzymes come together to create an immunosuppressive environment. And hopefully we'll be able to now take this uh, this assay forward in a prospective data collection studying anti-CD73 agents in, in, a, in a Bayesian adaptive clinical trial. But what about beyond immune markers and, and what does that look like? And here's a couple of just sort of brief examples in that exophytic melanoma from before, if you just look at the tumor compartment that's lit up here in, in multicolors, what we find when we use a, a number of different markers is that we have different types of, of, of tumor phenotypes. Here in, 
uh, ROI two and four, we have, we have tumor cells that are proliferative. They express KS67 and PCNA, and they're also differentiated. They express melanoma markers, MITF. However, in regions one and three, we don't have those markers. This, these areas are more de-differentiated and they're slowly, they're slow proliferators, not fast proliferators. And these have been postulated as being resistant states to therapy. So there are these dynamic oscillations and restruction of cell states that occur in tumors, even across a few centimeters of tissue that are important to understand. And we want to understand the drivers of these state transitions and the clinical implications for, for cancer care. We see this in a whole range of other cancers, including colon cancer and others as well. And beyond uh, those more sophisticated high dimensional phenotypes, you know, in, in, in cancer biology, we often, uh, in clinical work, we often will characterize uh, the, proliferative, the proliferative state of tumors. And we do that in two ways, either by looking at KS67, which is a, a marker of proliferation, whether tumors are low, medium, or high proliferators, or by mitosis, simply counting the number of mitoses that are present in a, in a, in a in a defined number of high power fields. This can be complicated though, because in a single, in a, in, in a single risk stratification system, um, in a tumor that might be, let's say six centimeters, uh, having four mitoses in 50 high powered fields um, indicates that that's a low risk of recurrence, whereas having just two more, six in 50 high powered fields in the same size tumor uh, indicates a much higher risk of recurrence. So these are complicated assessments that, that are now currently done by, by visual review. And maybe there's more information that we can start to bring by using more sophisticated multiple marker techniques uh, that are based on multiplexing and, and, uh, and, and and quantification. And I just want to show you just sort of a glimpse into that by work from George Ogalia and Shira Kabraji in, uh, in our group at the LSP, uh, studying pro different proliferative markers. And what you can see here is uh, it's clear that the traditional marker KS67 is not sufficient alone to define cell proliferation. In fact, we find cells that are often KS67 negative that have other proliferation markers such as PCNA, D a DNA replication factor, and MCM2 uh, replication licensing factor. So by using a multivariate um, marker of proliferation, which we call the, uh, the MPI, the multivariate proliferation index, we can define uh, proliferation in, a, in more sophisticated ways using multiple markers. So MPI1 cells are proliferative, these cells here are MPI zero quiescent and these cells are arrested by expressing one or sometimes both um, uh, uh, cell cycle arrest markers. We can then, um, you know, we can then look at a tumor, this is a breast cancer, look at 2 million cells in a cancer, separate the immune cells and the stromal cells from the tumor cells, focus our analysis in on the tumor compartment, identify the cells that are proliferative, not just the ones that are KS67 positive, but the other ones that are KS67 negative, but are likely also proliferative, and then start to understand their, 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 the, the, the meaning of, of these complicated, more, well, more, uh, more, uh, more comprehensive uh, indices in, in understanding proliferation here showing that these indices are higher, uh, proliferative cells are higher um, in triple negative breast cancer and HER2, and also studying their, the spatial distribution of these states across breast cancer, lung cancer, and ovarian cancer. It gets even more sophisticated and interesting when you start to consider cell cycle markers. Uh, and here, just, just to give you a sense of what that starts to look like. And it's, we're clearly gonna need conceptual and algorithmic innovations to start to make high dimensional assessments and apply uh, metrics uh, to clinical trial samples. And, and hopefully that's not in the too distant future. I just want to give you another example of cell biology discovery from, uh, again, from work by Giorgio Gallia. My group works on stress responses in cancer. We study heat shock factor one, which is the transcription factor that when cells are stressed, it, it, it trimerizes, uh, translocates to the nucleus and, and turns on um, proteins, the protective proteins uh, called chaperones. So this is how cells survive uh, a whole range of different types of perturbations. And we found in, in work that I won't discuss that HSF1 is co-opted in cancer cells placed in a nucleus and helps provide cancer cells with a whole range of functions that permit um, malignant progression and malignant um, behavior. And in, in Georgia decided to use uh, both multiplex tissue imaging and, and then going back and forth between those images and live cell imaging to try to understand um, the biology of HSF1 in cancer. And what he found is kind of interesting. So HSF1 is diffusely present in the nucleus of, uh, of cells before stress. And now this, um, 
these are this is cell culture. So ACS1 is present in the nucleus. When you stress cells with either thermal stress or HSP90 inhibition or proteasome inhib inhibitors, what's interesting is that actually it goes into these foci. And um, decades worth of studies have shown or have indicated that cells that have foci are stressed and therefore will have high chaperones. And that work has been based upon bulk analyses of, uh, of, of RNA and protein, Western blots and, and RNA PCR uh, type work as well. Um, but single cell analyses have not been performed. And if you look at these videos, it's kind of interesting because you, after stress, foci form, and then some, some cells will resolve um, the foci and other cells will not resolve the foci and go on to die. And this is kind of a bit of a spoiler as to the punchline of the, of the story. Previously using IHC, we only found HSF1 um, you know, present in the nucleus, but we didn't see any, any foci, pr presumably because of the resolution limitations of, of IHC. But when we use immunofluorescence um, here in a colon cancer, you can see very clearly that, that HSF1 is present in foci. And in fact, in fact, it's present in foci, mostly in tumor cells, but not in stromal cells. So we were finally able to detect these foci in bona fide human tissues, the kind of stuff that we were seeing previously in cell lines. And this is a, just a zoomed out view of a colon cancer and that these foci are present in these, in these spatial arrangements uh, across the tumor epithelium. We found that HSF1 foci are preferentially located in, located in cancer cells, as I mentioned, in primary tumors, but we also found that they were inversely correlated with chaperone expression, exactly the opposite of what we expected from, from bulk analyses of cell culture. So and you can see that, that, that here is um, decreasing chaperones with increasing levels of, of uh, HSF1 foci. So, so that was a bit perplexing and Giorgio then turned back to cell culture to study that more um, and found indeed when cells have foci, they have very little uh, chaperone RNA expression. And when they don't have foci, they have very high chaperone expression. And here is a plot showing that inverse correlation. And then if we were to track these cells over time, what we found is that the cells that do not resolve their foci when they form go on to die uh, under, um, under apoptotic mechanisms, whereas cells that form foci but then resolve these foci go on to live, presumably because these are the ones that are releasing, uh, releasing HSF1 to uh, transcriptionally activate chaperone expression. And we, with biophysical studies, and I won't go into much detail on them, we, 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 we do see that HSF1 forms small foci. These then coalesce to form larger and larger aggregates. The, um, the number of foci goes up rapidly and then decreases as these smaller foci coalesce into larger volumes. They become granular. And the model that we developed using a number of biophysical techniques is that in, in these stages, HSF1 is a liquid. It's uh, it, that can then, uh, these foci can resolve and HSF1 can then go on to tran transcribe target, protective target genes. Whereas over time, as the foci become more and more solid, HSF1 is aggregated and, and uh, heat, shock, a heat shock response cannot be induced. Okay, so that's an example of cell biology moving back and forth between tissues and, um, and cell lines to come up with, with um, hopefully new insights into regulation of a pathway that's been well studied before, but not studied in this manner. And now I just wanna end um, in the last couple of minutes discussing uh, the building of atlases. And this is an effort that's ongoing now as part of the Human Tumor Atlas Network, a network of 10 centers that are building atlases of precancers and cancers to better understand um, tumor biology and, and the complex tumor landscapes that, that are, that are, um, that are you know, parts of these, of these tumors. And I'm just showing these early maps of the night sky and the world uh, 500 years ago and 500 years later, we have more sophisticated views. And I think we're just at the beginning of a similar type of, of mapping and cartography, this molecular and cellular cartography that hopefully in the future, we lay the foundation for really important advances uh, for the future of cancer biology. This effort is really, um, really tremendous in many ways. And one is that it's a motivator of technology and software development. Uh, this is one example where we're taking one specimen, doing serial sections, distributing those sections across, across the country to multiple centers that are then, are then running different assays on these, um, uh, on, on, on these same specimens so that we can do, uh, do cross-platform comparisons. Uh, some of those assays are SciSIF, others are Codex and MIBI and um, Multiplex IHC. RNA spatial tro uh, profiling using GOMX, uh, also histology and obviously high dimensional analyses. So this, this effort is underway. This is an example of uh, SISIF data on a colon cancer from that effort. Um, you can see here 25 different sections have had 
SISIF, these are two by two pieces of colon cancer. And now we're building three dimensional reconstructions of these tumors and, uh, and doing comparisons between multiple assays. These are large data sets, 2.5 terabytes of data, just in this one colorectal cancer and an analysis of 10 million cells. We're learning some very basic truths uh, that FFPE has great morphology and frozen sections often do not. A lot of tissues and tissue banks uh, are, have uh, ice crystal artifacts. So methods that require frozen tissues are, are gonna need um, some significant uh, uh, methodological uh, biospecimen work to, to improve the quality of these types of specimens. We're also learning that there, there are issues with public viewing. How do you, um, how do you make complex tissue images intelligible and shareable? And we've, we're, we're trying to do this with a software developed by Peter's group at the LSP called Minerva. This is our current practice where we teach each other at the microscope using multi-headed microscopes uh, in, the, in the high dimensional world. We're hoping to be inspired by, by, um, by work done in museums with digital docents and interpretive narrator, narration. So for instance, we've developed a narrator where you can upload images, generate stories, uh, different types of stories, either histology-based stories or data analysis stories. Uh, their table of context, content, so you can click through and go to the different, um, the different waypoints. And at, at each, each way along the line, uh, the viewer can disengage with the story and pan, pan and zoom, look for themselves. Uh, there are channel groupings that are offered to show certain features, but there are also individual channels that can be explored um, separately. Uh, the software for Minerva is available um, on our GitHub, and also we have some stories available on our SciSIF.org uh, website, and offer a whole range of training uh, in terms of the basics of using this tool, um, which is now described on, on a, in a bioarchive manuscript that's currently under, under review um, as well. I also want to point out that, that the group is working very hard on image processing pipelines. This is work by Artem Sokolov and Dennis Shapiro. Um, using uh, developing a, a pipeline called MC Micro, and you, hopefully you'll hear more about this uh, type of pipeline effort uh, in, in the near future and its role in the Human Tumor Atlas Network. So in closing, I want to thank the Lab of Systems Pharmacology. Um, uh, Laura Malashevsky is the Executive Director, Peter Sorger is the Director. Uh, it's a fantastic multidisciplinary space that makes this kind of work possible with software engineers, data scientists, pathologists, oncologists. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just a fantastic place to work. And I feel very fortunate to be part of the team. Uh, here are members of the team. And um, with that, I'll just stop and uh, thank you all uh, for, for listening.